Good morning. It's certainly morning for me. Still have the dregs of my coffee. Um, thanks to Maria for inviting me and to Andrea for talking me to through the GoToWebinar interface. Um, hopefully I'll keep you entertained and maybe even give you some information. Um, if this is all about PFAS and in the world of biosolids these days, it seems like everything is all about PFAS. But to understand whether PFAS is a real concern for biosolids, you first have to understand some basics of risk assessment. So one thing with PFAS is it's all over the biosolids universe. It's been featured in The Guardian on multiple occasions, Forever Chemicals. Um, what isn't often mentioned is these chemicals have been around for a very long time, if not, if not quite forever. Uh, Roy Plunkett is the name of the person you can thank for inventing them. Um, and they've been in use since the 40s. The reason that um, they're in the news so much now is we can now detect them. They're very highly um, effective chemicals or a range of uh, class of compounds. And they've been used in multiple, multiple applications at very low levels. And they're complicated to analyze for, but now we have fancy machines and we can. And you can find them in parts per billion, parts per trillion, amazingly tiny concentration. So when you're putting these in the context of biosolids, realize that a lot of the long-term studies on biosolids to look at whether it's good for the soil, whether biosolids are good for the crops, whether biosolids have an impact on the soil microbial community, they've inadvertently been studying PFOS because if PFOS was poison to the soil microbial community in a biosolids matrix, nothing would be there. So just keep that in mind. Now, um, PFOS is the name or the general term for um, carbons attached to fluorines. And there are many, many different versions of this. There are long chains, there are short chains. Here are just a few. Um, PFOA and PFOS, the two at the top here, are the two most famous ones and the ones that have been banned. But there are many, many iterations. And in fact, um, here's a, a table from a recent paper looking at the different applications where these compounds are used, and in parentheses, you'll see types or reasons for uses. So um, you know about PFAS and biosolids, but plastic, rubber, and resins, um, refrigerant systems, apparel, automotive, they're all over. And this is something that you need to remember. Um, of the 9,000 plus versions of these compounds, um, in the US, it's not required to report how much you use in manufacturing unless you use a relatively enormous rate for something that's used in very low parts per million. Remember too that only two versions of these or the very long chain compounds, PFOA and PFAS have been phased out of production. That happened in the early 2000s. Um, at the same time that everybody's all concerned about these, these compounds and their safety, the forever chemicals and what can you touch, what can you not touch, the American Chemical Council is bragging about using this type of compound. So they're still a manufacturer, still in use, still ubiquitous, just not the two famous long chain band ones. Um, while the American Chemical Council is bragging about this in the world of municipal biosolids, it's, it's more of this type of reaction. And I would imagine you get the, the joke here. Um, it seems like the crisis of the decade for uh, wastewater treatment programs across the country. This really started for biosolids with this um, article in Environmental Science and Technology. Um, and it was about very high um, PFAS containing biosolids that were spread in Alabama. And were these being manufactured in the treatment process? No. Um, the 
wastewater treatment plant here was taking discharge from 3M, one of the big manufacturers of these compounds. And that was the reason. There was a very specialized industry in this um, watershed, in this treatment plant shed, that ended up highly contaminating the biosolids and the soils. And this was when it first hit the radar for biosolids. More recently, um, Maine. Maine is essentially ground zero for PFAS. And if you've been paying attention, the farmers in Maine, you read all about the farmers in Maine and you think the entire state and everybody that's ever grown a potato there is um, having a, a terrible crisis because of these compounds. Now, um, the farmers that are impacted, and we'll talk about them more in a bit, um, it's not good. And I'm not saying it's a good thing, but um, let's put this in some type of context. Now, in order to put it in some type of context, you have to understand the basics of risk assessment. So we're gonna have a 10 slide detour into risk assessment basics. There's two kind of endpoints when you're talking about risk. Acute toxicity is something that kills you right away. And in my husband's family, there's a long tradition of um, acute toxicity to game birds, uh, resulting in extensive eating of ducks, geese, a uh, range of uh, grouse um, by the Henry clan. Um, when you're talking about PFAS, you're not talking about acute toxicity. You're talking about chronic toxicity. So that's something that happens over a long period of time or much longer than, than the effects of shooting a bird with some buckshot. Um, and the effects can be really difficult to tease out. And here is a page from the CDC about chronic toxicity for PFAS. It's very hard because as people living and using the range of products that have PFAS, we get exposed. And we're not quite sure how to tease out um, outcomes specific to PFAS. Um, it, it's, it's a challenge. So here, we're not focusing with PFAS on acute toxicity. We're looking at chronic toxicity or effects over a long term. And to understand that, you have to understand the basic equation of risk assessment. It's um, risk is the hazard, how dangerous something is, times how much you're exposed to it. So water. Water can be hazardous in high enough quantities and with the appropriate exposure pathway. Normally, you just think you better drink your four glasses a day. Um, however, you look at something else, another common household product, bleach. This has a much higher hazard um, and requires much less exposure to be dangerous. And you can even read the warning on the label. Okay. Um, another Thing with risk assessment, you need a pathway, and it's a question of dose and response. So, where I live, there's a great sausage store in town, and they have wonderful bacon, and I buy it and I put it in the freezer. Is it bad for me sitting in the freezer? No, uh, it's not emitting these bacon um, volatile chemicals that'll somehow enter my system. I need the pathway you have to eat it. And that is the pathway that bacon can cause harm. And boy, doesn't that look nice in that picture? Um, when you're talking about the hazards posed by bacon, you have to think of a dose response curve. How much bacon do you need till you have a negative effect over time? So if you're eating one slice every two weeks, you probably can keep doing that for decade after decade and not have any adverse effects. If you eat eight slices a day, it's a different story. So that's your dose response curve. How much of a substance are you exposed to before you start noticing a response? Next thing you have to understand um, with a risk assessment is the whole concept of bioavailability. How much of the total is available to the receptor um, to do harm. Um, easy way to do this and continuing with the bad bacon pun is uh, making bacon or money. 
if you look at how much you're worth on paper, it might be a, a fairly large amount, you know, hopefully, and all of this. But if all of that is in your IRA and you're 40 years old, it's not available to you. It's not available for you to use or to have any impact. So bioavailability is the term used to say the portion of the total that's available to do good or harm. Um, this is a really old concept if you think about it. Um, soil testing, what you test your soil for to see nutrient availability, very, very rarely are you testing for total phosphorus. If you're looking at plant available phosphorus, you're looking at the bioavailable fraction of the total that's available for the plant to take up so it doesn't turn purple from phosphorus deficiency. Bray, Olson, Modified Morgan, Malik, these are all different standard soil extracts that measure the bioavailable fraction of the total nutrient. Okay, then finally, we're, we're getting near the end of basics of risk assessment. You have to understand the receptor. Um, so if you're concerned about a person, that's one thing. Um, and a person will need to be exposed to a certain amount of bleach to have a negative effect to send you to the ER and to rinse your eyes out. If you go swimming in a pool here, we're, we're combining my passion, the first example of water and of bleach, the target receptor here that you want to have a negative effect for is the bacteria swimming in the pool. They have a much more sensitive um, level of sensitivity to the bleach than we do. So you put a little bleach in the pool, a little chlorine, you can swim, not get sick, just destroy your hair. Bacteria are all dead and it's a wonderful thing. Um, Another concept is food chain transfer. If you put something in the soil that the worms eat and then the birds eat the worms, if the bioaccumulation factor is greater than one, it keeps magnifying in the food chain. Classic example of this is DDT, um, where it was used as a pesticide and it ended up um, having an unintended consequence of making bird eggs very, very fragile. So the birds never hatched and silent spring and the environmental movement was born. Now, when you look at the biosolids regulations and the whole process um, of their development, they, they got almost all of this right. Um, chronic toxicity, identifying the individual at risk, they looked at a range of different individuals. Um, they looked at the pathway of exposure. They looked at the bioavailability of contaminant through field studies. I did some of these. Um, they looked at a dose response curve. So you can be really comfortable with the 503 regulations on biosolids for both metals and the organics that were considered. And back in the day, they were things like dioxins that could in fact cause acute toxicity. But now lately, last 15 to 20 years, we have a new class of chemicals, pharmaceuticals and personal care products. And one could argue that PFAS fits into that, that grouping. And how does it work when you consider this whole risk assessment process um, for these personal care products? Um, and in most of these cases, home exposure or what goes on in your bathroom, living room, kitchen is going to be your primary source of exposure rather than the biosolids. And here's an example. Um, we published a paper that did different levels of biosolids required to get one daily home exposure dose. And I'll show you the one for the antimicrobial soaps. We just spent a weekend at the coast and there was the hand soap by the kitchen sink and it was advertising no Try Closan, no antimicrobial, which is for decades it had been advertising that it had antimicrobial. So it turns out if you use these antimicrobial soaps, they show up in your pee within an hour after you scrub your armpits. So they're clearly bioavailable entering the system. Try Clocarban and Triclosan are the two main ones. Colgate Total advertises that it has it in them. Um, you're getting exposed if you have a product that has any antimicrobial properties in your home. So we did a calculation 
to see how much biosolids you'd have to eat or how much vegetables grown in biosolids you'd have to eat to get the equivalent of one day home exposure to triclosan. And it turns out, um, and this kind of brings it home, that to get the equivalent of one day home exposure, you'd have to eat 3.8 tons of potatoes grown in biosolids. Now, one could argue that well before you hit the ton of potatoes in a day, you would be much sicker um, from the quantity of food than the triclosan exposure. So keep that in mind as we now go back to um, Forever Chemicals or PFAS. Um, one of the, this was a great piece in the New York Times Magazine section many years back. Um, and DuPont is one of the manufacturers that makes these compounds that pays for the American Chemical Society ad. Um, and this was a profile of a lawyer that realized that people in a town where the stuff was being made and discharged into river systems in high quantities, um, people were getting sick. And you read this and you get terrified, as you should for these people in this town. But then you have to look at biosolids and you have to look at biosolids in the majority of the US where there isn't a 3M facility or they haven't been making um, food service paper for decades. And you have to look at biosolids since the ban of PFOA and PFOS and you have to think, what is the pathway? Here are biosolids being applied to dry land wheat. Here's a retired agronomist from our area. What is the pathway? How did the PFAS get from the biosolids to the person? Okay. Now in Maine, um, what happened was in the 1980s and 1990s before the ban, there was a big pulp and paper industry. And most of the paper manufacturer in the state was for food service and coated paper. And for both of those types of paper, uh, we have a dog event going on outside here. Um, you use PFAS because it makes it so that the greasy pizza doesn't stick to the pizza box. Um, you read about the farms in Maine, there are about 10 or fewer farms that have been impacted. And the main pathway of concern was movement of the PFAS to groundwater and people drinking water from the wells. And the water in some of these wells was very high, way too, way above anything. Realize the limits are varied by state, by EPA, um, but these poor people in Maine, their limits, their, their water concentrations were very, very high. And this was their primary pathway of exposure. Um, now, these were um, cases of biosolids or pulp sludges where the pulp mill discharged directly into the wastewater treatment plant or where pulp sludge was added to the soil. Here's a study from Sepulveda um, 2011 looking at Chicago biosolids, which back in the day were certainly not known for their cleanliness. Um, but looking at the two banned compounds and looking at very, very high loading rates of biosolids, a thousand, hundreds of years of biosolids in 33 years. And what they saw here was basically very um, limited movement to groundwater from exceedingly high rates of biosolids. These are biosolids where they didn't have pulp mills. They're still higher than anything you would find today in PFAS and PFOA, but these are more typical. And if you wanna look at another example, um, Kern County, California, they were trying to ban biosolids application from the city of Los Angeles on the farm where the biosolids are land applied there. And their argument was that the biosolids were contaminating the soil with PFAS. And they did a lot of testing. They did testing of groundwater, they did testing of the soil, and looking at PFAS and PFOA concentrations. And you see tiny little, little tiny um, bars here in comparison to what you see in household dust. So home exposure is by far the greatest pathway compared with 
biosolids to soil and biosolids to soil to groundwater. Now, um, this just came out in the Seattle Times, my paper about how much PFAS contamin contamination we have in groundwater in the state. If you look at the um, the big highlighted joint base, Lewis McCord, Kit Navo base of Kitsap Banger, um, the biggest route to groundwater contamination has been military bases where firefighting foams contain very high concentrations of these. Um, I don't know if this shows up, my cursor shows up, but the majority of the biosolids in the state are applied to dry land wheat here, and also they're applied to forests here. This isn't the pathway. The much more common ubiquitous across the country is um, military bases and firefighter training areas. Now, I would argue that biosolids are not what you should worry about for PFAS. You should worry about what's going on in your house. Stain resistant carpets and fabrics, packaging, think of watching Netflix, sitting back with the pizza, the popcorn, the wine um, on your couch, which you don't want that wine stain to soak in or that grease stain to soak in. So what better way to prevent that is to treat the fabric with PFAS. How about that pizza box? How about that popcorn box? All these things, they contain PFAS. Um, here, you see this picture. You think McDonald's. You don't think PFAS. 69 million people every day worldwide are getting a Big Mac and fries. You see this woman, what do you think of? This is Kim Kardashian. Do you think of Kanye? Do you think of Pete Davidson? Um, what you might consider in a PFAS context is that she has about a half a pound of makeup smeared all over her face. Um, and that takes us to this really helpful graphic from the California Association of Sanitary Agencies. This is relative ranges in parts per trillion of different perfluorinated organics. And if you look at food packaging, look at these numbers. Look at those 69 million people every day that um, are eating their Big Macs. Look at Kim Kardashian and the amount of foundation she had on her face. Look at mascara, lipstick, look at carpets, look at household dust, and then look at biosolids. Which of these do you typically find in a home? The only thing that you're not finding in a home is, I, I mean, I do have a bucket of biosolids on my terrace, and we did get 15 yards delivered at the house, but for the average person, you're much more likely to find some food packaging than, than municipal biosolids. Now, um, the two big bad compounds, PFO and PFOS, were banned. And their concentration, and here I have Buffy the Vampire Slayer, which is a wonderful thing to stream, um, have decreased since the ban significantly in human blood, okay? Banning the compounds works. That's the way to get them out of us. It's also the way to get them out of biosolids. Here you can see this is um, work from Linda Lee's group at Purdue. Um, longer chain compounds are the hatched ones and 2014, 2016, and 2018. Quantities are decreasing, but we're still making a lot of these shorter chain, and so it's not going away quite as quickly as you want. Um, so are biosolids the primary route of exposure? And here are just some examples. Um, dental floss. Um, concentration of perfluorinated compounds in many dental floss products, 16 parts per billion. Um, the biosolids in this picture is the same biosolids I have on my terrace. It was 48 parts per billion. Which one am I gonna put in my mouth? Which one is gonna give me a direct exposure pathway? The biosolids were great for my tomatoes and great for the dahlias that I grew on the terrace, but I floss every night. And um, there was a recent study that showed a correlation between use of fluorinated dental floss and increased body burden of the compounds. You haven't seen that for biosolids or compost.
um, FDA tested a range of food products um, and found PFAS in a number of them, um, including this chocolate cake. Now, cake is a uh, expression or a term used to describe biosolids. The chocolate cake tested had 17 parts per billion of PFAS and same cake here with 48, which would you rather eat? And here I'm making a bad biosolids pun using the term cake, but you get the picture. Finally, this is our, our girl Sophie, who is now out for a walk. And she's on our relatively new um, dog safe carpet, which means it's loaded with PFAS. Um, a study looked at concentrations of perfluorinated compounds in dog and cat feces in Albany, New York, as a surrogate um, for human feces, figuring that exposure pathways in the home would be similar. Now, um, I, I, I am a very much a dog person. Cats, I will admit, had lower PFAS burden, but um, the concentrations of PFAS in the dog poop were about double or triple that in the biosolids. So that, according to these authors, is suggesting that uh, human exposure or human poop has about triple the PFAS as biosolids. So, so we're the source to the treatment plant, not the other way. So what do you do with this? These are not good compounds. Um, you do not want these in your biosolids. You don't want them in your house. Um, in Maine, where they had that legacy cases of contamination and made the news, um, and it's sort of ground zero, what they did was they banned biosolids. Um, what's happened as a result of that ban is the municipal treatment works are now paying about double to triple to find a place to put the biosolids, namely landfills. Um, as a result of farmers not having access to the biosolids, um, you're using more and more synthetic fertilizers. You're having much higher greenhouse gas emissions because biosolids in a landfill give out a lot of methane, some nitrous oxide, and then using the synthetic fertilizers has their own set of environmental problems. In contrast, Michigan, I would argue, had a much more balanced approach. They asked municipalities or required municipalities to test their materials to see what their um, PFAS concentrations were. If they were above a certain level, the municipalities were then tasked with source control, identifying the source of the PFAS into their system. As you remember from an earlier slide, these things are used in so many applications. Um, if it was below that target level, it was business as usual. Um, and if a source was identified with source control, then that source was required to pretreat or not discharge into the plant. And that has significantly reduced the number of plants with elevated um, PFAS in their biosolids. And it seems like a very, very environmentally friendly, reasonable way to deal with these compounds that are perceived as dangerous and still being used in so many applications. So I don't know if that's too fast or too much, but that's what I have here showing me and an example of me inflicting acute toxicity on a barracuda. I just went to Fiji for a couple of weeks and um, this was uh, my prize catch. And so if there are any questions, happy to answer them. And thanks for your time. Um, wanna take a quick moment to tell you about a few events coming up. Uh, first off, we have our next Ona highlight, which the date has not been determined yet, but the speaker will be Chris Pravat, who was previously with us and is now the Alabama Farmers Farm Federation Commodity Director of Beef, Hay, and Forage, Sheep and Goats, and Equine. And he is going to be presenting market outlook and managing production costs in a volatile economic environment. And probably by the time I get the recording for today's presentation ready to send to you, I will have that date and I will share the link to register for that. So be watching for that information.
Next up, we have our 40th annual Florida Cattlemen's Institute and Allied Trade Show with BQA certification. That's going to be held at the Okeechobee Agri Civic Center um, on Tuesday, January the 24th from 8.30 to 3. And there is a very small registration fee. It says $5 by January 20th. And you can use your phone to scan that QR code to register. I will also send you this flyer in my email with the video recording. If you don't already follow us, I highly recommend it. You can check out our website. You can follow us on social media at Facebook, Twitter, or YouTube. All of our videos from past webinars are located there, as well as all of our field day recordings and other special events that have been recorded. And if you do not get our email, please send me an email at ona at ifis.ufl.edu, and I will add you to our mailing list so that you can get once a week email news uh, what's going on, what's coming up, and anything interesting that you would possibly benefit from hearing about. Okay, Dr. Brown, question is, how do you view toxicity in blueberries? I don't. Okay, that was very quick and easy. I mean, I, uh, I, I enjoy them in my granola when they're in season here. <laughs> Next question is how do you think that biosolids regulations will move forward in other states? Um, I'm hoping they follow the Michigan model um, and not the Maine model. Um, I think that a lot of this is education and outreach and people realizing that home exposure is by far um, the most significant pathway. Um, source control has been really effective as a means to reduce contaminant input into the municipal wastewater system, and I think it can be used here as we've seen in Michigan. Okay. All right, next we have a comment from Dr. Engel. He says, thanks, Sally. Great talk. Thanks, Scott. Glad to know you were there. <laughs> next up, we have a question. As you mentioned, long-term soil health appears to be still good, even though PFAS have been applied via biosolids for decades. Has this not also been the case with human exposure via household exposure? We do not see significant impact or connection to the effect. To effect. What are your thoughts? Uh, my th this is why this stuff is so complicated to understand. And if you, um, that slide on the CDC potential effects that I showed, um, it's really, really hard. How do you find a control group when you have a compound that's in everyone's blood? How do you test? Um, I, would, I would think that low level exposure is probably not a significant um, cause of problems, but I'm not um, I'm not an epidemiologist. I'm a soil scientist, so I would likely agree. But I'm not an expert. That's more of you'd have to get somebody from the medical school to present. Okay. All right. Next question: Does composting biosolids with yard waste change PFAS levels? Um, so it can. Um, if the yard waste has lower PFAS than the biosolids um, and you're making a mixture, you'll effectively dilute the PFAS. Uh, 